Welcome everyone to our panel discussion today, Inside, Outside, Upside Down. My name is Fiona Yodan, and I will be leading our panelists today through a discussion around intergovernmental organizations and data privacy. So how are we going to manage this today? Let's have a quick look at our agenda. We are going to have a quick look at who our panelists are and clarify some concepts around IGOs. We have 45 minutes to deal with quite complex topics and navigate through some very detailed issues for IGOs. So we will have a first round of um, rapid fire questions and then we'll have a second session where we deep dive into some of the more complex issues in this day and then finally we'll summarize and look at some questions. If you do have any questions during the session please use the chat function. We will try to get to them time permitting of course but you'd always be able to contact the panelists directly through the EGORPA website, and we'll be sure to post that link at the end. So let's get to meet who's going to be on our panel today. Um, Gabrielle and Costanza join us from an intergovernmental organization that specializes in particle physics research. Gabriella is the data protection officer there and also the IGORPA board chair. Constanza is the deputy head of the data privacy office there. Um, we are waiting for Lena to join us and she is the data protection officer at the European Space Agency. And you might have heard David speaking earlier and he is an experienced attorney that's worked as a DPO at an IGO. So together we have a panel that brings a broad depth of experience, skills and knowledge to the topics. And we welcome them to this discussion today. So you would have heard me say, all of our panelists come from IGOPA. And what is IGOPA exactly? Um, it's a nonprofit organization and works in the area of data protection and intergovernmental organizations. There are really a lot of complexities around the differences between IGOs, NGOs, and international or multinational businesses. But in a nutshell, the main differences between these three is essentially who has created them. Um, intergovernmental organizations, of course, are created by governments. Um, NGOs are created by people, associations, or businesses. And of course, international companies or multinational businesses are businesses operating in different countries for profit. So you can see there is quite a um, obvious difference between them. Um, I'm not going to go into the complexities around what each of these uh, specifically have that are different to each other because we will end up in an economics lecture and I'm sure we don't feel like that right now. <laughs> so that's our brief intro. We are of course being mindful of time so that we can get through our questions. and. I think it's time to get going on that one. My first question for the panelists, um, what do you see as the biggest privacy challenge for IGOs? Um, perhaps that's a good point for you to take up, David. Short answer, I think uh, getting people to understand that uh, IGOs are not subject to the GDPR, that's a real big challenge for us. Great. And the other panelists, do you have anything to add there? Yes, I would say that for me, the biggest challenge is to make all member states happy. 
um, because the canvas probably different legal frameworks themselves. And uh, so finding one solution that fits all is always challenging. Yeah, definitely sounds like a tough one. And Costanza, do you have anything to add there? Yes, I would say that for me, the biggest challenge is to ensure accountability in the absence of an external given data privacy framework. Oh, interesting points that you raised. Um, we touched briefly on GDPR. Wouldn't it just be easier if intergovernmental organizations voluntarily adhere to GDPR? I would say that it might not be easy uh, since uh, uh, IGOs have a specific status, they have to preserve their privileges and immunities, and thus the applicants of GDPR might turn out to be a sort of empty shell without uh, the power to enforce some of its provisions. Thank you for that. I, I, I think if it makes all member states happy, why not? But um, I think, uh, again, uh, like Constanza said, it's difficult to reconcile GTBR with the specific status of uh, IGOs. Yeah, I'm glad to see Liana managed to join us. Sorry about that, Liana, for the technical glitch, but we're very happy that you can be participate. Uh, nice to be here. Sure not sure, when you, already. <laughs> not sure when you entered the conversation, but uh, yeah, from my point of view, I can only agree with Costanza and Gabby to say it's, um, you know, can really undermine the uh, objectives of having international organizations, which is really meant to uh, even out um, cooperation between bigger and smaller countries. And so once you get subject to GDPR, there's some real issues that could undermine that status. So I think the other issues as well, but that's really the, the point, the main point uh, around why GDPR could be problematic. Principles are not problematic. Um, it's really the status of an international organization. Thanks for that. Um, and now to touch on something a bit different from challenges and um, looking at GDPR, social media is really ubiquitous for all of us. Um, most companies, businesses are on social media and most people have a social media account of some sort. Um, why do so many IGOs not have social media? Is there a reason for this? Maybe I could mention that we seek to avoid um, working with social media, especially where there have been large fines. So of course, oh. Facebook is one of the companies which has been heavily fined. And the question would be, do we want to expose those who interact with us to companies that are not compliant? It's not good for us, it's not good for them, it doesn't ensure data subject rights. So there are multiple reputation and risk factors. Uh, in the worst case, you may even be a joint controller and jointly liable. Uh, so it's something I would not promote unless, ideally we would have a European social media, which is GDPR compliant. Uh, it's, it's something I'm trying to innovate <laughs> <laughs> you need a lot of funds for this, I guess. Not been successful on that. Yeah, I, I would like to add that I'm not really sure if um, IGOs don't use social media because I, I see some presence um, of, I, of IGOs on social media, um, Council of Europe, I don't know, but other international organizations are present on Facebook and so on. But I see they use these tools rather like a communication tool to the outside, but not to interact with the people. So I think this maybe limits a little bit risk. Um, and uh, yeah, so, but I rejoin Lena's point of view. I think if we had a GDPR compliant tool, um, also IGOs would use this probably a little bit more often. I think one of the issues is if you do have uh, social media, you have to monitor it if people are interacting back with the organization. If you're just broadcasting outwards, there's not such a major risk, especially if you're not promoting putting people out. But one of the 
issues that we do see in the news quite a lot, obviously, are deep fakes and fake news. And if people have recordings or images posted everywhere, it's possible that they may be manipulated and, and some of your projects may be disrupted. So by people making statements they never made, etc., which can very quickly become a major issue. Very good points. Uh, David, do you have any to share? Or no, yeah, I see Cassandra once has her hand up. Let her go first, and yeah. then I, I have I have some good news about this topic. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I absolutely agree with Gabby's and Lena view. And another point might be that this tendency to use social media uh, by I goes more from the sharing the information aspect than the collection of information might also be because the purposes that the IGOs are pursuing are probably very different from the necessity to boost sales or to provide customized service, uh, which are instead key for private entities. Yeah, absolutely. I, I saw a news headline that the EDPS has uh, launched a um, beta version of a social media app um, and another app. So I think they are testing that for the institutions of Europe um, because I think they also face very similar problems uh, sort of um, representing um, the European institutions and using social media. We all acknowledge that they're useful. So um, I think they've taken a, a good stride there to present the beta model and we'll see what happens and how the adoption goes. Super, thank you for that. <coughs> And now and we've touched briefly on social media, personal data, people expressing opinions, but what do you as members of intergovernmental organizations or past members in, in reference to David, think of people donating their personal data to IGOs? Is this problematic? Are there complexities around this issue that we need to understand? I'm happy to kick that one off. Yeah, I think it's it's an increasing topic, um, especially with Brexit and the UK. They're looking more at building up trusts, which they've done in the health sector for quite some time. But there is a recognition that international organizations have always worked for the international good. Uh, United Nations, I think, is an easy one to identify. Many of the scientific NGO, um, IGOs uh, like um, CERN or EMBL uh, or the European Space Agency also have a common good. So I think there is a recognition that just as in the past people donated money, there's uh, the possibility that uh, people would be able to donate data um, for the purpose of that common good. Um, so there's quite a lot of discussion around around that. And I think each, each um, IGO has a different perspective because they, they operate in different areas and in different fields. So I think for somebody like Embel, it's more meaningful because they, they work with, um, you know, a lot of uh, data uh, around uh, life sciences. So, you know, donation of um, personal data there is quite different from other areas. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can add that um, as trust is one, I think, uh, the main themes of this Privacy Week in New Zealand, um, I think the trust is a, is a very important point when you donate data to an international organization or to another actor. So I think if, if this IGO comes already with a nice data protection framework, I think we, we have best preconditions. And in addition, we shouldn't forget that um, IGOs have privileges and immunities. And that means in general, they have an inviolability of their archives and documents, which creates a wonderful, nice extra layer of data protection. So that means I think the trust, um, I think can be easily provided by the IGOs and uh, people who donate data to this IGO, I think can have a good feeling that um, the data is not sold or otherwise misused. I think trust comes with transparency. So if the IGO applies privacy by design, in other words, collecting minimum personal data for the legitimate purpose and making it transparent, then 
people know what they are in for and I think the trust is built on a base of accountability and responsibility. So there's no risk for them. They know what they decide on when they submit the data. I would uh, add that, uh, of course, um, some privacy obligation might not be uh, a necessity to be respected based on the purpose for which uh, I go process personal data. If we think about, for example, genuine research purposes. Uh, but on the other side, I think that the, the biggest risk, yes, is to have privacy casted aside just because data are freely donated. So that's something that uh, should be kept in mind. Thank you for that. Um, Gabrielle, you mentioned briefly around um, having a data protection framework. And I'd just like to ask the panelists on how does data privacy impact the relationship between IGOs and their member states? Looking at the privileges, immunities, the sharing of data and all the complexities around that. Yeah, maybe as I have mentioned it, I can also um, reply to that question very quickly. Um, I think I said already um, data protection um, it's always a kind of compromise on an IGO because we are composed of many different countries. So that means you will probably not make all of your member states happy. So mm -hmm. that means, um, um, yeah, you can have member states which uh, welcome the fact that we have data protection, also an IGO, which allows us easily um, to to exchange data with them. We, we have the same kind of level of, um, of protection in place. So for those countries, I think it's, it's it's a very good thing, boosts, um, I think, the exchange also, um, yeah, the, the, the whole work of the, of the IGO is much simplified. But we have also member states who have another, let's say, expectation and, uh, yeah, and find it very cumbersome that we can't share any longer with them the data that they would like to have. So I think it's, yeah, that, that's not... Um, um, it's, it's always a kind of balancing. <laughs> yeah, I can only echo that. And I think uh, the different IGOs have different experiences, but in this one issue, I think there's quite a lot of common uh, experience. Um, and I think it is really comforting to meet member states that are quite uh, understanding and advanced and, and support that uh, program. But it's also... Um, quite interesting to to meet member states who who are not at that same um, maturity level, um, and to to get them accustomed to the idea that things have changed, uh, even though uh, GDPR might not be uh, directly applicable. Um, many IGOs still try to follow those principles. I would add to that that yes, uh, there are many challenges, but. Uh, considering the fact that probably IGOs would have their own data privacy framework. Uh, one positive aspect is for sure the possibility to see that data protection can be ensured uh, by both the parties, the member state and the IGOs, even though the ways and approaches to implement it may differ. Maybe I just add that in general, what I do see, for example, in Convention 108 or the policies or data protection frameworks of IGOs, we do see that we have common principles similar to GDPR. So in the end, it's everybody working towards the same standard Europe-wide and even beyond Europe in, for example, Convention 108. And it seems to be setting a trend more and more that it's becoming an issue around the world, but obviously all the new technologies, we definitely don't want to be tracked night and day. So I think this will grow. Uh, it's more a question of being at the start and raising more awareness and understanding and demonstrating that the standards in the end are aiming at the same level, the same principles. So 
Good. Anything else to add from our panelists before we get to our next set of um, agenda items? All good? Super. So we had our short question session and we're now going to move into some deep dive topics. Um, we've touched briefly on these, and I think it's a good idea to expand some of these details and really get into the nuts and bolts of how we need to approach or look at some of these issues that are facing IGOs and, of course, um, in turn, the data protection community. So I'm going to start with um, looking at the privacy challenges for IGOs. I know we touched briefly on that, but I think we can really expand that more to get some more details, insights. Um, there are many uh, participants who've never worked in an ITO before and don't um, have that context to be able to um, immediately uh, understand the complexity of what actually surrounds this. So let's take a look at that. Um, Whoever wants to kick that off can go. I think Costanza, you had some thoughts on that earlier on that you mentioned. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to kick that off. I briefly mentioned before that uh, uh, for me, the biggest challenge for IGOS is to implement accountability. And this is because uh, IGOS, uh, we already said they have a specific status, they enjoy certain privileges, immunities, like uh, availability of archives, immunity from legal process, uh, immunity from jurisdiction. Those privileges and immunities are there to ensure their independent and effective functioning. But on the other side, this means that they are not subject to GDPR to, or to an external data protection law. Uh, they are not subject to an external data protection authority that can supervise uh, the implementation of data protection rules. And they are not threatened by uh, data protection sanction, for example, the ones that can be found in GDPR. And thus, this might seem like a very positive thing because it might entail that IGOs can do anything they want when it comes to data protection. In reality, IGOs still need to ensure that data protection is effective because they are not an island, they are not closed up in a bubble. They interact with EU stakeholder, uh, extra EU stakeholder, visitor, participant to conferences. They have many, many relationships. And so all these entities and people that IGOs interact with expect their privacy to be preserved, expect a certain element of data protection to be implemented. And so this means that uh, IGOs might have to do an extra effort in order to build their own data protection framework while respecting their privileges and immunities to uh, consider the possibility to have their own supervisory authority or an entity with similar function and to find a way to ensure that the data protection rule, the data protection frameworks that they, be, they have built are respected even though they cannot rely on sanction. So they cannot rely on the deterrent effect of sanction and they might have to find a more original or a different solution or perspective. So for this, I would say uh, accountability is a big challenge. Yeah, eloquently put there, Costanza. Um, yeah, I think that uh, you know the the UN has has been interacting with the EDPB. Um, it's all on the EDPB's website if you care to go and read it. And I think um, what Costanza has described is the fundamental problem, and it comes out in different ways. Um, and from those UN interactions, you can see it comes out in difficulties around contracting, uh, difficulties in getting service providers. It, it just plays out in a lot of practical issues uh, in the day-to-day -day work of IGOs, and in some cases can be a really serious hindrance. Um, and so those kind of day-to-day -day issues are all discussed in those documents. Um, and yeah, I think that tension between what the expectation is of uh, 
people who interact with, with IGOs and um, people who don't know what IGOs are uh, and the need for IGOs to maintain the international status causes quite a lot of practical problems. So I can only underline what both Gabby and Costanza have said, building your own program, making it legitimate, and then, as Lena said, making it transparent is probably the best way you're going to solve those problems. Well, I think one of the key issues, having placed a new policy, launching it with our own independent supervisory authority, which I might mention are judges from the member states' courts of law, largely or, or very highly recognized experts. Um, one of the key issues you face is really convincing industry. So that meant really having lots of meetings and explaining it. So raising awareness, training them, giving them the full picture. And once they understand, it's the first time. And after that, it runs. So once they understand what it means and in which context it's set, it's, it's much easier. But it is a lot of work because obviously everybody first thinks national law applies, GDPR, Europe-wide. Um, and when that's not the case, it's as it is in the IGO, it's international law. And they obviously would not be aware of this because it's quite an exclusive, different situation. But once they get this understanding, we found that our contracts run and, and there's no more need to discuss because the concept has been understood. Yeah, that requires, I completely agree with you, and I want to add that this requires a lot of communication, a lot of awareness raising, and uh, I think an IGO has not unlimited resources, and uh, we see this, uh, this effort to communicate um, the specifics of an IGO to our partners, to external actors, is really very important. We have to try to speak also their, their language. That means um, being in Europe, we obviously use always um, references to GDPR to make the people understand how we work as an IGO, which kind of specifics we have. Um, so that means this communication part is for, un, for us one of the very, very important points. And uh, uh, I think without that, um, what you describe, Lena, is impossible to put in place. Yeah, I think uh, just to echo that and to do a, a pitch, but I think that's why EGORPA's role is really important because in this, there are some areas where you can really join together and get this, the common message across. And this is one of them. You know that IGOs are different and they do work differently, but they they have their own um, approach. Uh, and I think you know that's the value of coming together in an organisation like Egorpa that works only in IGOs and data protection. Um, if anybody's interested, I'll put the links up uh, in the chat. Okay, thank you for that. So moving on to our next speaker, which is um, we've looked a bit at um, sharing, donating personal data, and the issues around uh, data privacy for IGOs. But um, since all of our panelists have joined us from um, scientific areas of IGOs, how do we balance sharing scientific research with data protection? What do we need to look out for here? Well, I mean, under data protection law, we have the possibility to keep personal data for longer, especially for research or historical purposes. The, the question is really, what is the risk, firstly? Um, how do you want to mitigate this risk? Is the data, can it be anonymized over the long term? Uh, can it be reused? Do you need consent? So multiple aspects and angles have to be investigated upfront when planning your process, and then it will be quite easy to put into place with the right measures. Yeah, I, I think what's particularly important is, does the legal framework of the IGO allow for processing of personal data for scientific purposes? And so that's not always evident. Huh? Um, working in a particle physics environment, um, personal data for scientific purposes and researchable purposes is just not, not necessary. Yeah? 
particles are not humans. So that means uh, our research centers around non-personal data. So and if suddenly some, some project comes and says, oh, we would like maybe use personal data, then that can create some, yeah, some difficulties if the framework, legal framework for data protection doesn't take into account this possibility as well. So I think uh, um, for me, the most important point here is to consider um, the legal framework which should allow for the processing of uh, personal data for scientific and research purposes. Yeah, I would also say you know, there's different challenges in different environments. Uh, you know, one of the contentious issues is around associating scientific research and data with uh, scientists' personal data. And I mean, that's a shifting ground all the time. You know, something that really wasn't under discussion in terms of the scientific method uh, for hundreds of years, but now, you know, is is a controversial issue where you know people want to control their personal data within the scientific community uh, by let's say removing or deleting their names associated with certain research um, and that stands in such contrast with the tradition of scientific method that really can be a challenge so i think you'll find all of these little issues that gabby and lena raised uh, they, they they come out in all of these strange ways that maybe many organizations don't have to deal with, but international organizations that do scientific research really have to find a challenge. You know? So even if you're dealing with particle physics and it's a, it's a more straightforward than perhaps um, uh, bio, biological research, it still comes up with these quirky issues. I think in, in general, we have to look case by case. Uh, for example, we do scientific human research uh, or research into cancer, simply because when you go out into space, you might obviously reduce gravity and, and cancer research could benefit from a lot of this and new environment. But the issue is what, how you prepare this experiment, if people have been made fully aware, if they have provided consent, if even you could, from the specimens you use, identify the next five generations. So the children and the children and the children of that data subject whose tissue might be put into our space. Um, so there are multiple questions you really have to face. On the other hand, depending how the data is dealt with, data today could be personal data tomorrow. So you might think it's definitely not personal data, but with the possibilities to combine a new technology, we're facing more and more issues. And again, if we put it into a, risk context, a conflict situation, um, then you may be facing people who want to sabotage specific projects uh, and looking at data and combining data is probably a lot more that we don't even want to think about that is possible. Um, so I think the risk is absolutely crucial and finding out exactly what all the options are so that you can proactively put the right measures in place. So your research becomes more like a risk management project in, in essence. Uh, again, looking at minimum data for the purpose and maximum protection throughout the data life cycle and data, data flow. So wherever this data moves over any borders, yeah, and you know, we all know that that is a, magnif a magnificent change for a lot of people to even start to consider uh, in the previous scientific world, consider that, that uh, there could be limits on that uh, personal data. But my experience is they're getting quite used to it now. <laughs> you know, it's not Yeah, unknown. and I think we have to also look at the benefits. Without research, we would not advance. So we don't really want to block it, but we don't want to engage, endanger anyone. It's really also a balance. And finally, most of it is based on consent in general when it comes to at least to medical research. So we, we should be aware of what we decide. Yeah, and I think that's really relevant also for the European environment because Europe funds quite a lot of independent, you know, research even in intergovernmental organizations. And, you know, there's always that need to respect that funding relationship uh, and um, the data privacy culture of, of the funders and the expectations. 
yeah and I would I would say when you get funding from European Union at least um, the ITO must undergo necessarily a risk assessment and uh, so I think the framework is pretty tight and um, one shouldn't think that an IGO can do what, whatever they want with personal data for research. Um, I think it's rather the contrary. It's um, we have a very tight framework for processing personal data of research. So, yeah. Yeah, some of those uh, ethics evaluations can be can be quite tight and quite tough. So that's a very good point. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I just want to ask one last question. Um, all the panelists have touched briefly on um, how things change, ethics, um, how the frameworks um, guide and manage uh, the data protection issues for an IGO, but can or could member states ask personal data of their nationals from an IGO? I think this is That's something they one. desire. <laughs> they do ask, but what we generally do is we we take the requests internally, and uh, you know, if they're asking for contact details of staff members of a certain nationality, for example, we inform the staff that there is an interest from this body to be in touch with them, and they may themselves, if they wish, contact the body. So it's usually the consulate or it may be any other kind of national office, but you know, we don't send our data outside without a legitimate purpose or we don't disclose unless there's a legal basis. Yeah, same, say, same here. But we have to say also, we, we have some data exchange in particular with our host states in order to provide for the administrative formalities um, residence permit, work permit, so all these um, formalities require an exchange of personal data, but this is really framed um, by a legal obligation by our host um, agreement, host states agreement um, with our host states. So I think when we exchange personal data with our member states, it is really for a very, very good purpose. And yeah, and if, we ex if we get requests like Lena, you said, um, yeah, Give us the name of our nationals. We want to, I don't know, organize an event for them. This we direct to the persons concerned directly so that they can answer. So we have the same principle in our IGO. And how does this help smooth the relationship between the IGO and member states? Because I know, Gabriel, earlier on, you mentioned that there is a fine line trying to keep everyone happy and still managing to fulfill the functions of your job. Yeah, so, so that, that means one. sometimes, yeah, sometimes we have to make the people unhappy. But uh, again, it really it depends on the country um, and its own legal framework. And if they are used, um, that nowadays data cannot be shared easily, they accept a no. And um, we try, and in, in fact, in general, to propose at least to provide them with figures. Often they are much more interested in statistics. And so we provide them with, with statistics. That means anonymized personal data. You cannot identify anybody. And um, this, I think, um, yeah, provides still a good relationship with our member states. Yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting example of that overall tension that that balance that you always have to have with the member states. It's a really good particular example uh, um, to give around that. Um, and yeah, as as Gabby said, uh, moving towards giving statistics is probably the better solution um, uh, in that circumstance. But uh, what, as Leona says, you try to allow the individuals to participate because sometimes they really want to do that. Um, but I think overall, what that demonstrates for us is, you know, how you um, maintain your status as an international organization while still interacting with uh, member states and making sure that their uh, interests are, are taken care of. But it also shows why it's important that uh, IGOs get together and discuss these topics because one of the biggest <laughs> hindrances is when a member state says, but this IGO, this IGO gave me all of that data. And then, and then you have to answer that question and say, yes, but 
the rest of us, we don't do that. So I think it's important to speak as one voice and come together in, in, on these common issues. Thank you for that. Um, Stanza, Leza, Gabriel, do you have anything to add there? Maybe I Just, would add that uh, policy yeah. regulates the disclosure of personal data. So that's the first place we go. Go ahead, Constance. I wanted just to say that uh, I absolutely agree with everything that was said. And um, yes, in particular, with regard to the relationship with member states, uh, what David said, uh, uh, come together, share a perspective, find uh, alternative solution uh, that might satisfy both the member state, but also the individual who might really, really want to be in touch uh, for specific purposes. It's um, a very key element. Super, thanks everyone. And I think that's really all we have time for today. We are getting very close to the end of our session. So um, we have three minutes. Um, does anyone want to say anything very specific around our discussions that we've had this morning? Super. Okay, so um, I'd like to thank all those participants who joined us and also thank the panelists. It was very engaging, interesting discussion around, I think, very complex issues that uh, we need much longer to unravel and uh, understand a lot of the detail. Um, I see the Igorka website has been shared in the chat, and I invite all the participants here to go onto the website to connect with any of the panelists. And there you'd be able to um, connect, share information, ask questions, and um, obviously learn a lot more about IGOs themselves. So I think if we have nothing else to add, we can call it a day, two minutes early. And thank you everyone for attending, and I wish you a great day further. Thank you very much, Thank you. Fiona. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.